pleasure to give this mini course. And uh, so may I erase at least one of these? Yeah. <laughs> so my uh, lecture today is called Algebra and Representation Theory, not Vector Space. What I want to do is, so, so I'm going to work over a field, K, which is an algebraically closed field uh, of arbitrary characteristic. And uh, uh, so, I, so let's consider the category. So suppose G is a, is a group. And uh, one of the main objects of study of representation theory is the category of representations of the group G over the field K. So this is a category of finite dimensional representation. The actions of G on finite dimensional vector spaces. And what I want to do is I want to abstract away the group and the vector spaces. And uh, just uh, think about this category, what kind of structures and properties this category has. This will allow us to extend representation theory to more general categories where we don't have a realization of these categories on vector space. And we will see uh, uh, that we will get some new examples. And uh, at the end of my mini course, we will see how this uh, theory can be applied to studying ordinary representation theory with groups and with vector spaces in positive characteristic, namely modular representations. Okay, so, uh, and this course is going to be intertwined uh, with uh, some other courses uh, that have, uh, that we have here, especially Maud's uh, course and uh, maybe Joel's course. Uh, so, uh, so let me uh, proceed now. So, uh, so what I want to do is I want to list some important properties and structures of this category, and then I will forget about this category and just axiomatize those structures. So first of all, this category is uh, uh, a k-linear abelian category, uh, which means uh, that k-linear means that morphisms in this category form a k-vector space. Uh, composition of morphisms is bilinear. Uh, and abelian category means a bunch of properties such as existence of direct sums, existence of the zero object, existence of kernels, co-kernels, images of morphisms. And, uh, and then uh, I will not spell this out because I, uh, I need another property and then I will characterize categories which satisfy both. So another property is uh, that it is Artinian which means that objects have finite length, object has a finite filtration, such that successive quotients are simple, uh, and, uh, uh, and homes are finite dimensional. And so, uh, together, so these properties together, if I take them together, this is equivalent to, to saying that my category, uh, let me call this category C. So C is, uh, 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 C comod, which is a category of finite dimensional comodules over a foil algebra C. So that's an explicit realization. This co algebra is not unique, uh, but um, you can uh, require that this algebra is pointed, which means every simple comodule is one dimensional. And in this case, uh, it is unique. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, the next, uh, so these are kind of additive, uh, this is additive structure of this category. Uh, but the more, something that I will be more interested in is the multiplicative structure, is uh, uh, mm, uh, that this category is monoidal. And uh, this comes from the fact that we have a notion of tensor product of representations. So if you have X and Y in rep KG, then we can attach to their tensor product X tensor Y, which is usual tensor product of vector spaces. And uh, an element of the group acting on X tensor Y is simply G acting on X tensor with G acting on Y. Now, uh, so, uh, so how, uh, how to abstract this away? So, so this uh, leads to the notion of monoidal category. Uh, and uh, this notion is the following that uh, uh, we have, uh, so what does it mean? Uh, 
to have to be uh, to, to for a category to be monoidal it means that we are given a by functor of tensor product and um, well uh, so so it's a kind of categorical uh, analog of monoid where we have a, a semi group law and of course the first axiom we impose is associativity so uh, uh, so we want this to also be associative uh, so we want to say that x tensor y tensor z equals to x tensor with y tensor z. But it, this turns out to be a bit too naive because in category theory, uh, one of the important principles that we usually don't want to say that objects are equal to each other. We want to uh, say, uh, because uh, uh, equal means that there exists an isomorphism between them and uh, uh, then uh, there could be many such isomorphisms. So what we need to do is, instead of saying that they are equal, we should say that they are isomorphic and specify the isomorphism as part of the data. So, uh, so this means that uh, we, uh, there is an additional piece of data. There should be an additional piece of data, which is called alpha x, y, z, from x, y, z to isomorphism to x cross y cross z. Uh, this is called the associativity isomorphism, associativity constraint. Uh, and then, uh, well, this piece of data should satisfy some axiom. And this axiom should be a higher analog of associativity, which should involve four objects. Well, indeed, if you have a product of four objects, and let me drop the tensor product signs to make the diagram more compact. So suppose we have uh, a product of four objects like this with this position of brackets. And then uh, we can have a position of brackets when they are completely to the right. So this means X, Y. There are actually two different ways to go from here to here. One way is in two steps and the other way is in three steps. Uh, and uh, 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 so these ways are the following. So uh, the way uh, that is in, uh, in two steps is the following, that we move, uh, that we look at three objects, X, Y, Z, and T and move these brackets to the right. So this means we have alpha x, y, z, t. And this will be x, y, z, t. And then we can move these brackets to the right. So this is going to be alpha x, y, z, t. But then uh, also uh, we can uh, move the in internal brackets to the right. And this will take us, so this will be alpha x, y, z, tensor identity of t. And this will take us to x, y, z, t. And then uh, we can uh, move the outer brackets. So this is going to be alpha x, y, z, t to x, y, z, and finally alpha one x times alpha y z t and this diagram should be commutative and uh, this is called the pentagon relation and so this is what we should replace the definition uh, with the definition of a semi-group so semi-group is an associative multiplication law and here there is a multiplication law, which is a functor. Then there is a associativity isomorphism, which should be functorial x, y, and z, which means it commutes with morphisms in the first, second, and third factor. And this isomorphism should satisfy the pentagon relation. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, we want to have an analog not of a semi-group, but of a monoid, which means that we want to have a unit. And uh, there, you can add axioms of the unit, but they can actually be conveniently summarized uh, in the following way, that um, uh, there exists object one, such that one tensor one is isomorphic to one, and the functors of tensoring with one on the left and on the right from C to C uh, are equivalent, which basically means that they are invertible. 
there is a functor the other direction such that composition in any order is uh, uh, isomorphic to the identity so, so in fact uh, if uh, such one exists then these functors are not just equivalences but they're isomorphic to the identity which is easy to show because the square of this functor is this functor itself anyway so this is what it means so for the category to be monoidal uh, and in a monoidal category, uh, so there, there is a, a so-called McLean coherence theorem, which says basically that uh, it, it doesn't matter uh, how you put parentheses. So in other words, well, this is a coherence condition for a product of four things, but what about five things, six things, and so on? Well, it turns out that once this is satisfied, you don't have to worry about position of parentheses anymore. So, uh, so if you have uh, so any two parentheses, any two, I, so so consider. So the theorem says the following: uh, consider two parentheses x one, x n, uh, uh, and I'm going to call them. Uh, x and x prime. Uh, then any two isomorphisms, uh, beta and gamma from x to x prime, obtained from alpha are the same. So in other words, if you have a parenthesization of the product of any number of factors and uh, you go uh, along some cycle back to this parenthesization using alpha maps and their inverses, you always get the identity. There is no way to get anything else. Mm -hmm. And this means basically that you can forget about the parenthesis position. So I'm going to ignore them from now on. Okay, then there is another thing, another, uh, 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 structure on this category is uh, that this is symmetric. So, so, so what does it mean? So this is uh, just the fact that if you tensor two representations, then there is an obvious isomorphism with the tensor product in the opposite order, which is just the, uh, uh, the flip map. And this is an isomorphism of representations. And if you do it twice, you get back the identity. So again, we want to abstract this away and axiomatize so, uh, so what, the, what is a symmetric category? This means that you have uh, for, uh, for every uh, uh, two objects, X and Y. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, a permutation map, X tensor Y to Y tensor X, again, functorial in X and Y. And uh, this, uh, again, we, uh, so we don't want to say that x and y, x tensor y equals y tensor x, because again, we are in a category, but we want to say that they are isomorphic and uh, then require that this isomorphism satisfy some natural properties. And what are the natural properties? Well, natural property is that if you flip, uh, if you switch x with a product of two things, uh, it, a, in one uh, uh, step, it is the same as to do it in two steps. And the other, and also to move it to the left. So, uh, so if you want to switch x with y z, uh, well, you can do it in one step, y z x, and this will be c x y z. But you can do it in two steps. So first, switch it with y y x z, and this is x c x y tensor one z. And now uh, this uh, switch x and z. So uh, this will be one y tensor c x z, and uh, the other relation would be x y z. And now you want to switch z with x y, so I can do it in one step. So z x y, and this is c x y comma z. But I can do it in two steps. First, switch it with y. Uh, so this is going to be uh, x z y, and the map is one x tensor with c y z and then switch z with x and uh, this will be c x z tensor to one y and so uh, 
So these are uh, these are called hexagon relations, and uh, maybe somebody can say why they are called hexagon relations while these are actually triangles. <laughs> why? What do? You... That's right, exactly. So uh, if you write this completely with the brackets, you will also in each of these diagrams there will also be three alphas, and you will get a hexagon. Okay, and uh, uh, and so this is called. Uh, so if you have such a thing. Uh, uh, this is called a braiding, and uh, C equipped with C is called a braided monoidal category. And, uh, the reason it is called uh, uh, this way is because uh, if you have an object X in such a category and you multiply it by itself n times, then, uh, then this carries an action of the braid group. And recall that braid group has generators B1 up to B n minus 1 with appropriate relations. And so, uh, so bi uh, acts by c i i plus one. So it acts c acting in tensor factors i and i plus one. But 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 our category has a stronger property. It is symmetric, which uh, also has the property that you flip it twice, uh, you get the identity. In the braided category, that's not the case because in the braid group, uh, so generator has this form here, and if you do it again. You will get this, and this is a uh, this is not a trivial brain, uh, uh, and so uh, in a braided category, double flip isn't equal to the identity in general. But in our category, uh, it is. So a braided category is symmetric. Uh, C uh, x y composed with C y x is uh, the identity flip is the identity. So, and, uh, so our category is symmetric. Uh, also, uh, an, an important uh, structure that we have is the uh, uh, existence of dual representation. So if x uh, in rep kg, then uh, we have the dual x dual uh, also in rep kg. Uh, so this is an ordinary dual space, but g Acting on X dual is uh, G inverse dual acting on X. Uh, G inverse acting on X dual operator. So, and uh, again, uh, we want to abstract that away. And this is what is called the rigid category. Uh, and uh, so let me, uh, because also, I think Joel made this in his talk and uh, said that uh, he doesn't want to discuss this. So maybe I should uh, uh, maybe I should uh, mention what this means. Uh, so uh, so this means the following: that uh, for every object x, uh, there exists uh, another object x dual, uh, and. Uh, there exist uh, uh, the, the following uh, maps, uh, which are called evaluation X, which is X tensor X dual tensor X to the unit, and coevaluation X, X tensor X uh, um, unit to X tensor X dual. And I say there exist instead of they are given which means that this is going to be a property, not a structure. So the previously, the monoidal thing uh, is a structure. So there is a functor, there is an associativity isomorphism. Symmetric is also a structure. So you have to put C, which should satisfy some condition. Rigid is the property, it's not a structure, which means it is either rigid or not, which means that in fact, if these things exist, then they are unique up to isomorphism, up to unique isomorphism. Uh, and, and there should be the following uh, diagrams. So, so first of all, if you start with X, if you do coevaluation unit, so coevaluation X times one X, and this goes to X, 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 and then do one X tensor evaluation x back to x uh, is, uh, is the identity. And similarly for x, uh, if you start with x dual, 
and do uh, uh, one x dual times co-evaluation x x star x x star and then you do evaluation x tensor unit x dual to x dual is the identity of x dual so this is uh, what it means uh, rigid case so this uh, uh, has good properties of duality. And these axioms can be easily remembered if you uh, uh, interpret them topologically, namely, uh, well, uh, uh, so the co-evaluation X uh, from one, uh, so, so it could be denoted by this cup where one corresponds to nothing. And then here is X, X dual. And evaluation X can be denoted by cap. So these are the caps and cups that you saw in the Joel's talk. Uh, X dual X. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, for example, this thing can be uh, interpreted as follows. So you start with X and then uh, you do co-evaluation. So it means you have a cup uh, and then you have a cap x x star x x x so so this is a, a an isotope when we take this thing and we straighten it up and make it like this and the same uh, interpretation for the other so these things really uh, allow you to uh, interpret morphisms topologically like this uh, and uh, so, so this is a multiplicative structure on so our category. And then there are two more properties. Uh, so let me erase this thing. So one property, of course, when you have, uh, so uh, uh, we want to define the notion of tensor category, which is supposed to be categorification of the notion of a ring. A ring has an abelian group structure. It's an additive structure and a multiplicative structure, but we also, want them to be compatible. So we want to have a distributivity law. A times B plus C equals to AB plus AC. And similarly here, uh, uh, the way here is that a uh, tensor product of morphisms. So remember, tensor product is a function. So in particular, it acts on morphisms. And morphisms form vector spaces. So tensor product of morphisms is bilinear. And this is going to imply all the properties we want, such as X tensor with Y plus Z equals to X tensor Y plus X tensor Z and so on. And, uh, and finally, uh, there is a property that in the morphisms of the unit, we want it to be K. So in general, uh, endomorphisms of union could be uh, a direct sum of several copies of A. But in that case, our category will simply be a direct sum of several copies of uh, uh, categories where uh, endomorphisms is just A. So this is a very minor condition. And then we make a definition. Uh, a, a category C with such properties and structures. is called uh, symmetric. So that's the main definition. Okay, so uh, so now from now on, uh, we will try to consider, you know, other examples of symmetric tensor categories and consider various properties of this case. So any questions? Yes. So we drop the condition that it's very simple, right? The exactly, yes. It's not assumed. And in fact, uh, we will consider examples which are not. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I said K-linear abelian category, in particular, it means that it has direct sum. Okay. So it's a, it's a category of co-modules over some co-algebra, which if you like, you can take to be pointed. In this case, it will be uniquely determined. It's monoidal and braided and more uh, uh, is So this is what I, uh, what I call a symmetric tensor category. Oh, yeah. if, I, if, I, if I say tensor category, 
So uh, if I say braided tensor category, it means that I don't assume that's this, this identity. And if I say tensor category, this means that I don't assume the existence of C at all, or that I'm given any C. Okay, so, uh, so now examples. Uh, so so may, may, maybe I, I should mention it is not, uh, we're not assuming that our category is semi-simple, uh, but an important property tensor category for any rigid tensor category even doesn't have to be symmetric rigid. Tensor category. The functor of tensor product is uh, by exact. So it is exact with respect to each variable because, in general, tensor product is only going to be right exact. Uh, but, uh, but if your category is, uh, is rigid, then you can prove that it's actually exact in each. And uh, therefore, and what follows from this is that you can define the notion of Grotten any such category for any such category uh, it's growth in the group by it's a free abelian group whose basis are the classes of simple objects uh, girl C is a ring uh, with basis of simples uh, and uh, the unit is a part of this basis. So unit is simple and uh, uh, structured constants, non-negative integer. Okay, so, uh, so now what are examples? Well, well first of all, uh, we have this basic example, rep K of G that we started with. And so our definition was tailored in such a way that this is an example. So that's not surprising. And in particular, I should point out the simplest possible example, G equals to one, uh, then we get the category of vector spaces over K. So this is a finite dimensional K vector spaces. Okay, now can we generalize this? Well, yes. Uh, for example, let's say G is a Lie algebra over K. Well, in this case, we can consider rep G, uh, and this is going to be also, or this is a category of finite dimensional representation of G, and this is uh, also a symmetric tensor category. So I'm going to use uh, abbreviation STC for symmetric tensor category. So these are examples of symmetric tensor category. Well, and uh, so the tensor product of representations of Lie algebra, so, so if A, is in G, then A acting on the tensor product X tensor Y is A X tensor one plus one tensor A Y. And so, uh, and actually uh, here is another example, which will end up being this, the same as this, but it has a slightly different flavor. So let's say X is a, a, a nice topological space. Uh, so let's say Hausdorff. And in fact, uh, you will lose nothing if you imagine that X is a manifold, connected manifold. And then we can take C to be the category of local systems or locally constant sheets on X. So log X local systems, which is the same as locally constant sheaves uh, of K vector space of finite dimensional K vector spaces. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we can tensor them just, you know, fiber by fiber and also dualize them fiber by fiber. So this is a symmetric tensor category. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's equivalent to the, a category like that where G is the fundamental group of X. So if X is a point in X and G is a fundamental group of X with base point X, then uh, uh, log X 
can be identified together with its uh, tensor structures. So all the structures with uh, representations of uh, G. Let me call it G sub X. However, uh, the important thing is that uh, when I uh, write it down this way, I have to pick a point. But when I write it down this way, I don't pick a point. So, uh, so I can describe this uh, using this language of locally constant shifts, I can describe this category without picking a point on this. May, well, uh, um, I, I, I guess I, I did something uh, which is not allowed, which is as it, I uh, talked about equivalence of uh, uh, tensor categories without defining what this means. So perhaps I should do that. Uh, so uh, for this purpose, we need to define monoidal functors. So suppose that we have C and D, which are monoidal categories. Uh, and suppose F from C to D is a functor. So a noidal functor, we want to be a functor that preserves the tensor product. So, uh, so F is monoidal if F of X tensor F of Y is uh, equal to F of X tensor Y. But again, this is too naive. So we should not say equal, we should say isomorphic and we should prescribe an isomorphism. So let me call this JXY. Uh, and this should be part of the data. So we are given this JXY. Uh, and, uh, and this is called the tensor structure. Uh, and it should satisfy some condition. And what is this condition? Well, it should uh, be for one more factor. So we start with F of X, F of Y, F of Z. And here we have uh, alpha f of x, f of y, f of z, f of x tensored with f of y times f of z. So this is the associativity isomorphism of the category D. On the other hand, we have a similar diagram. So if you have x, y, z, and f, of x, y, z, then there is a f of alpha x, y, z. And this is the uh, associativity map of C. And uh, so now this G should relate these two things in such a way that we get a commutative diagram. So here we can do J, x, y. This goes to f of x tensor y f of z and then j x y z here similarly we have one x tensor j y z and then j x y z and this diagram should be commuted so this is what it means to have a monoidal functor well and we should also require that f of one d at one c is isomorphic to one D. So it's a, uh, uh, categorifies the notion of a unital homomorphism of monoids. Uh, and uh, uh, so then uh, we have a notion of braided monoidal functor. Uh, it just means that it preserves uh, so uh, this notion makes sense between the braided respectively symmetric monoidal categories. And this J uh, should conjugate uh, the uh, braiding of one category into the braiding of the other. Uh, and also uh, we have a notion of equivalence, monoidal equivalence that was symmetric or just monoidal. Uh, it, it is just a, a uh, such functor, which is an equivalence of categories, which means it's essentially surjective and fully phrased. Monoidal categories which differ, well, two monoidal categories which are related by a monoidal equivalence are, uh, you know, the same for all practical purposes. Uh, and uh, what we want is to classify. So we want, so our goal 
is classify symmetric tensor categories up to symmetric monoidal equivalents. So this classification is not known and we are not going to reach this goal, but we will reach it partially. So under some conditions, we can classify these categories and that's actually a very interesting story. Any questions? On that mistaken, the motivating category is verbenius, right? By nature. Uh, I was just wondering. So, so if G is a finite group, yes. then uh, this will be a Frobenius algebra. That's right. Yes. But if, if it's an infinite group, then we don't, we don't have such an easy problem. So at, at the moment, you don't have any assumption on the group, right? No, I don't have any assumption. And so you do not view that Frobenius property as one of the features you wish to carry? No, no, if the category is finite, which means it has enough projectives, it is going to be, so there is a theorem that any rigid tensor category, which is finite, which means it has enough projectives uh, uh, and finitely many simple objects, or even, even enough projectives is sufficient, doesn't even have to have finitely many simple objects. Enough projective means that it has any object as a quotient of a projective. So if that is satisfied, then the category is going to be Frobenius, which means projectives are going to be also injected. Uh, but for infinite groups, that's not going to be the case. Other questions? A question from the chat. Is there any specialty to define J from the Fx of, uh, times Fy to Fx times Y instead of the other way around? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can, uh, you can also define J to go the other direction because it's supposed to be an isomorphism. But it should be functorial in X and Y. But if you are given a functor such that f of x tensor f of y is isomorphic to f of x tensor y for every x and y, that doesn't mean that you have a monoidal functor. In fact, you have to find this j, and it's supposed to satisfy a nonlinear, actually quadratic equation. And uh, you might not have solutions to this equation. Then you don't have a functor. There, and that's why there could be, uh, for example, semi-simple categories with the same Grothendieck decree, which are not equivalent. Because uh, you, you may define an additive functor which sends every basis element to itself, but it's not going to be equipped with this J. You won't be able to solve those equations. Okay, so these are some examples. Huh? Question? Yes. Um, so just uh, maybe about this. Um, so the structure constants that you have in your growth in the green are not enough to... Uh, to specify, to uh, classify your category. That's what you mean, you would have it is, to- First of all, it is not enough. And also it may not exist. So if I give you a growth in decree, okay. um, then, uh, well, for any class of this category, ordinary braided or symmetric, you may have none or you may have many. Yeah, so, so you, you could give an example of two categories which are braided, symmetric, monoidal, or I, I tend to give that, That's right, yes. With having same structure constants. Yes, for, for example, uh, there are, uh, uh, the, well, you know, you know that there are finite groups which are not isomorphic, but have the same character table. Mm -hmm. So that gives you such an example. Moreover, there are even finite groups that are not isomorphic, but their representation categories are is equivalent as, a, as mo monoidal, as tensor categories, but without braiding. If you, if you ask it to be symmetric monoidal, then the group is determined. And that's something I will talk about later. But if you drop the, the symmetry, then it's not determined. So you could have on the same monoidal category, which is of the form rep G, where G is a finite group over complex, complex representations. You may have two different groups, which have the equivalent monoidal categories of representations, but different symmetric structures. So, and uh, when I said that these categories are equivalent, this is the sense in which I meant that to be the case. Okay. Uh, but there is actually an umbrella example which turns uh, out to uh, cover all of this. And this is representations of affine group schemes. So, uh, so let uh, um, G be an affine group scheme over K. So this simply means uh, that uh, we have uh, so a fine scheme is the same thing as a commutative ring, which is a ring of regular functions. So this means uh, 
uh, uh, we have uh, and a fine uh, scheme over k means it's a k algebra, commutative k algebra. So we have uh, uh, algebra of functions in G, but, but because G is a group, this has a co-product. And so this is a commutative Hopf algebra over the field K. And then uh, representations of G is the same thing as O of G for modules. And I always talk about finite dimensional co -modules. So, uh, so this uh, turns out to uh, encompass all of these examples. And uh, so to uh, explain this, uh, I'm going to, oh, maybe I should mention, uh, so uh, a fine group scheme uh, in characteristics over a field of characteristic zero is always reduced and uh, is uh, what is called a pro-algebraic group. So it's a projective limit of algebraic groups. In uh, characteristic P, it may have, uh, it may be non-reduced. But what does it have? To, but it always has something to do with groups uh, because uh, you have a Grothendieck functor of points. So functor of points uh, says that if R is a commutative K algebra, then you can define uh, R points of G to be home from this function algebra on G into R. And uh, this is a set which turns out to be a group. Easy to, easy to define a group law on it. Uh, and this, so this uh, R goes to G of R is a, uh, is a functor from uh, commutative K algebras. And now if you have, uh, if V is a representation of G, then for every R, V, tensored over K with R is a, a G of R module. So, uh, so we get a family of representations of family of groups parameterized by arbitrary commutative rings. And this is of course compatible with more maps between rings. So it's functorial in R. Okay, and, and now uh, I want to explain uh, why this example, like why did I call it umbrella example? Because it actually encompasses all these examples. Well. We saw that examples one and three are the same, but example two is different. And uh, in fact, this encompasses both. And uh, to explain this, I want to introduce the notion of fiber functor. So fiber functor on a symmetric tensor category C is a symmetric monoidal functor to the category of vector spaces over K. Uh, which is, uh, and I should require that it is exact, is an exact uh, symmetric monoidal functor C to vector spaces over K. And then um, one can show that it's automatically faithful. And so why is it called the fiber functor? Well, it's exactly because of this example three. Uh, so in example three, uh, so we have category C, which is uh, vector spaces, uh, which, which is local systems on the topological space X. And so if you have X and X, then you have a functor F sub X from C to vector spaces over K, which sends local system L to its fiber at the point X. Uh, so local system is just a family of vector spaces continuously varying over uh, the uh, your space and having a flat connection, which means that for every curve between two points, you have holonomy between the fibers, and this depends only on the homotopy class. So uh, this is a fiber functor. And uh, well, another example, if you do an example one, uh, where you take representations over K of G, where G is an abstract group, uh, then you have just one single functor uh, from uh, uh, which sends uh, representation V to just V as a vector space. We see that uh, both, well, in this case, the category is canonically defined, but to give a fiber functor, we need to fix a point. Here it is the other way. The category uh, is, uh, uh, so if we want to attach it to X, uh, we need uh, 
to if you want to write this category in terms of uh, representations of fundamental group, we have to fix a point, but that the fiber functor is canonically defined. But in any case, uh, there is a theorem of the lean and mill. It's not very hard, which says that if a fiber functor exists, it is unique up to an isomorphism. Uh, I did not define isomorphisms of monoidal functors, but, uh, but the definition is kind of self-evident. It's an isomorphism of functors that commutes with the tensor structures. So it should preserve not only the functor structure, but also the tensor structure. Uh, for, and then in this example, we see that if you have our topological space X and have two points X and Y in this space, so we have these functors Fx and Fy in this example, and these functors are isomorphic. To define their isomorphism, we have to fix a, a path gamma from X to Y, which we can do because our space is, uh, maybe I should call pathwise connected. Uh, and then we can take holonomy from X to Y. So holonomy around gamma will define us a map from LX to LY for every local system L, which is an isomorphic. However, we can choose another path, and then uh, if it is not homotopic to this one, we will get another isomorphism. So, uh, in, so therefore, when I say here that it's unique up to isomorphism, it's unique up to a non-unique isomorphism, which means that the isomorphism between two fiber functors isn't canonical. This creates some difficulties, but, uh, but nevertheless, at least it's unique up to isomorphism. Then uh, this functor, uh, so uh, here it is, uh, uh, so this is called forgetful functor. So this functor is forgetful. It actually doesn't forget anything because you can reconstruct the group G from this functor. Well, it forgets, uh, it forgets something, but it doesn't forget the group G. Uh, not this group G, but this one, the affine group scheme. So, so if you, uh, so, so what you can do is, uh, is the following for any, so if you have C a symmetric tensor category and F from C to vector spaces over K uh, is a fiber functor, it doesn't always exist, but suppose it does. Then what we can do is we can take, uh, if we can define G to be the affine group scheme of tensor automorphisms of F. This is an affine group scheme. And so, uh, uh, so what does it mean? That means that uh, if I have a commutative ring R, uh, then uh, uh, this is the set of tensor automorphisms to write underline because it's, an, uh, it's not a set, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a scheme, uh, which means it's the functor, we can think about schemes, it's functors on commutative rings. And namely, if we, uh, so this G of R is tensor automorphisms of the functor F sub R, where F sub R is a functor from C to R modules, where F R of V is uh, F of V tensor over K with R. So it's points over our ground field K are just ordinary tensor automorphisms of this functor. So automorphisms of this functor, which preserve the tensor structure. And then there is a Tanakian reconstruction theorem, Tanakian reconstruction theorem, also contained in the paper, the lean mill and Tanakian categories. So Tanakian reconstruction theorem says that uh, then C is equivalent to representations of this affine group scheme G. So if it has a fiber functor, then it is uh, uh, of this form. And uh, it's easy to see that these categories do have fiber functors. Representations of an abstract group has a fiber functor and representation of Lie algebra has a fiber functor, which is just forget, forgetful functor into vector spaces. So these categories uh, are of this form. And so if you have, uh, for example, in this case, if you have, let me call gamma is an abstract group, then rep K gamma is equal to rep G for some affine group scheme. And this G is what is called, let's say, a characteristic. Well, 
So this G is what is called pro-algebraic completion. In other words, this G is obtained by taking the inverse limit of all homomorphisms from gamma to a fine algebraic group. Uh, more explicitly, uh, O of G is uh, the set of all functions uh, F in functions on gamma uh, such that uh, 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 gamma F gamma is finite dimension. So functions which on gamma which, uh, with values in K, which generate a finite dimensional representation of gamma cross gamma. Such functions form a Hopf algebra and uh, that's what this O of G is. Okay, and so maybe let me finish by saying that, uh, uh, so definition uh, a symmetric tensor category is called Tanakian, if it admits a fiber. So a Tanakian category is uh, of the form rep G. G is an affine group scheme over K. And this G is uniquely determined. Uniqueness of G uh, follows from the uniqueness of the fiber functor up to isomorphism. And in fact, G is uniquely determined up to an inner, up to inner atomorphism. So, uh, which means uh, that uh, okay, so if you have two fiber functors and take, uh, so if you, if you realize your category as two representations of two different groups, rep G1 is isomorphic to C and rep G2 isomorphic to C, you fix those isomorphisms. This doesn't define an isomorphism from G1 to G2, but it defines their isomorphism defined up to inner automorphisms of either of them. Okay, but now the question is, uh, do there exist categories that do not admit such a functor? And the answer is yes, obviously, there is category of super vector spaces. And uh, this is the simplest example of such a category. And then uh, we will discuss next time uh, that it produces a whole family of categories which have fiber functors in the super vector spaces called super fiber functors. And those categories are representation categories of affine super group schemes. So, and then we will discuss what other examples exist. So I will not spoil, so let us wait until tomorrow. Yes. 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 So I was wondering where does this uh, faithfulness probability comes from uh, in the tensor structure? Like uh, a fiber functor is automatically faithful, you said? Faithful. Yeah. Uh, well, it's basically because our category is abelian. If our category weren't abelian, then uh, then uh, it's not going to be faithful. It could have a kernel. Okay, so it has no uh, no link with the... Uh, with the yeah, because kernel of such a functor will have to be what is called a tensor ideal. Uh, and an abelian... Um, uh, so, uh, moreover, this should be... Uh, uh, so it, it's a it's an idea it's it's a thick ideal, which means it's generated by objects, and uh, abelian tensor categories don't have such ideas. So a, in fact, any uh, uh, exact uh, symmetric monoidal functor uh, out of a uh, abelian tensor category has to be faced. For free, at least for some reasons, that uh, such a category was was. Co-modules over a co-algebra. Oh, that's right. Yes. But then that's to get, here. To, to get a, a Hopf algebra, we kind of you kind of did it from scratch. Is, yes, is, that's right. Because uh, uh, so uh, such a category. So so it's a, it's a co-algebra, but tensor structure doesn't define a Hopf uh, algebra structure on this uh, algebra. It defines something that I call pseudo Hopf algebra structure which is not quite a co-product. Because for example, when you uh, take, let's say you take a finite group and you take functions on the finite group. So this is a co-algebra, uh, but it's not a pointed co-algebra because it's uh, irreducible uh, co-modules are irreducible representations of this group. So if the group is not abelian, they're not one dimensional. So if, if you took uh, the pointed co-algebra, which means with one dimensional co-modules, you wouldn't be able to put on it a structure of a Hopf function. Nevertheless, you can, 
whenever you realize your category is a core algebra, you can write all the remaining structures, such as the structure of a tensor category, in terms of linear algebra related to that core algebra. And that's what I call a pseudo hop algebra. It's a rather unwieldy structure, but it's useful uh, uh, for uh, it's useful in applications. But it's not nearly as nice as the structure of a hop algebra. Uh, well, I mean, there is uh, there is even an analog of Tanakian reconstruction in the tensor category case without any braiding. Uh, so, uh, so you have, so if you have, uh, so maybe let me erase this, we'll obtain a quantum group, not the usual group. So, uh, so if C is a, a, a rigid uh, tensor category, not necessarily braided, have a F from C to vector spaces over K, uh, exact tensor functor, uh, then, uh, well, you cannot talk about automorphisms, but we, you can talk about something that is called core end F. So uh, core end is a, is a, it's a dual. So if you look at endomorphisms of F, it's a uh, topological algebra because it has a topology of projective limit. So you can take its dual uh, continuous with respect to this inverse limit topology. And that's called coend F. But, but actually it's better not to talk about end and topology and you can just define this uh, directly. So for example, if the category is semi-simple, this is just going to be a direct sum of all simple objects X tensored with X dual. So it's like fun Peter Weil, functions on the group. And, uh, and so this is a, this is a Hopf algebra. Uh, and uh, let me call it H. And C is equivalent to the category of H co-modules. But this Hopf algebra is not going to be commutative. It's going to be a quantum group. In particular, when the category is braided, this Hopf algebra will be what is called co-quasi triangle. So it will have an R form, which is dual object to an R matrix, which will correspond to the braiding. Did you thank uh, Pavel last time? Thank you. Thank you.